have our panel discussion. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Dr. John Sutherland. Uh, Professor Sutherland is the head of environmental and ecological engineering. He is a uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering and has had an illustrious career in both mechanical and environmental engineering. And so I will turn it over to John to uh, be the head wrangler in chief. All right. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm going to, going to introduce all our panelists that are up here and then ask them to each say a few words about their background and their expertise. And why don't we start with the gentleman that just introduced me, David Barr. Okay, so hi, I'm Dave Barr, as I said, Head of Materials Engineering. Um, it's just for a little bit of background, I actually, for the students here, I did my degree here uh, for bachelor's and master's degrees in materials and in metallurgical because we hadn't switched over between materials and metallurgical during that degree period. So the bachelor's was materials and the master's was metallurgical. I went on to University of Minnesota for my PhD. Uh, I've been doing materials reliability, mechanical properties of materials, uh, and how materials deform uh, for about 30 years now. And I've had about 25 years in academia, starting at Washington State University, becoming department head there, and then transitioning to department head here in 2012. So my interests uh, that tie into this have to do with the school as a whole. I think our school is moving towards an area where as enrollment grows and as the students' interest in sustainability and in societal impact has grown, uh, it's important for us as a school to think about, you know, if we make bumper stickers that say we can't make without materials, we may have to think about how we make those materials and what the impact of that making is. So that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today. Thank you, David. Uh, next up, we have Linda Saros, who is, uh, um, comes from Arcelor. Right, I'm a proud Purdue grad. Um, if I was a year older, I'd be a math teacher. But um, Purdue started a summer engineering um, program for women um, when I was between my junior and senior year. <coughs> and I came down to see the campus and decided this engineering stuff is fun and I'd like to be an engineer. Um, and that served me well. I was able to get a summer engineering job at Inland Steel after my freshman year because there weren't a whole lot of girls around. Um, they wouldn't put me out in the mill because I was not yet 18. Um, but I managed to um, retire from Inland and successor companies uh, 47 years later. So I was happy to be asked back to like relive my steel days. I retired in 21. But Inland gave me a, an opportunity to work with a lot of different people, including Dr. Cram, <laughs> uh, for a short period of time. And, um, and I love the steel industry. So I'm glad to be here. Next up, we have the reason we're all here today, Alan Cram. Did you want to say anything else in addition to comments from earlier in your introduction? Maybe a a fact that we didn't know about. Sure, the sure. Why well, I'd be challenged to think of a fact you didn't know that already said. Uh, I, I think uh, the one, one thing I would say is that uh, I, I've been fortunate to be at three different universities and three different uh, technical engineering based universities, as this is a technical engineering university also. And uh, I found them both all to be really interesting places full of very smart people who wanted to make a difference. and. Uh, I think the highlight of my career was the 19 PhD students I have and the 28 master's students I had. And I probably learned more from them than I ever did from anything else. And uh, that's the beauty of uh, being in engineering schools. Very nice. Uh, next up, Eric Boria, who is uh, from GTI Energy. Hello, everyone. Uh, Eric Boria. I'm a senior analyst and project manager at GTI Energy. Uh, it's an organization that does research and development for um, energy projects across the U.S. Um, I work on the Department of Community Benefits that works on developing and implementing community benefits and impacts for these kind of projects, led by Elizabeth Coach, who is on the Sustainability Committee of the MRS Journal. Uh, my background, uh, I have a PhD in sociology uh, where the topic was looking at community response to the dredging of the Indiana Harbor in East Chicago, uh, and a master's in urban planning and policy uh, from UIC. 
And uh, apparently there's a theme here going on. My father made his career at Inland Steel and then ArcelorMittal Steel as a research engineer. Uh, so apparently we have that uh, theme going on here. Glad to be here. All right, well let's, let's hear for the panelists before we get started. So our, our panel over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is going to be, is there a path for green materials production for structural materials? So this is a panel session, so people should feel free to, if they have a question, to raise their hand and, and we'll try to get that, that question answered. So I'm, I'm kind of looking out there to see whether there's any <coughs> pent up questions. So let me start. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you all to figure out who is best positioned to respond to this. But uh, as we heard from Alan uh, earlier, as steel production aims to reduce its carbon footprint, are there any unintended consequences to recycling steel using EAF that come to mind? I I think Alan really touched on the major issue in the presentation, um, especially as EAF steel started um, producing uh, for sheet steel, where formability is more important. The residuals um, that continue to be present in the scrap can really restrict um, the use on some like deep drawing applications and those kind of things. Um, you need to. Um, really watch nitrogen specifically, um, but there's a lot of other tramp elements that cause a problem. And you can't call those unintended, you really should, people have been designing for that for 20 years already since they started that. You just need to know the end application. That's, that's very good. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, Alan. I think unintended consequences are inability to uh, capture all of the dusts. You know, and the dust uh, is a hazardous waste that can be transported across state lines. So unintended consequence be when you release it because you didn't expect to. Other unintended consequences could be also uh, the gas that's coming off of even an electric arc furnace at high temperature uh, can precipitate dioxins, et cetera, as it cools down. And that has a, you know, a really severe effect on local environments. So, so I, I think that that's two. The other one is that I, I just spent time on a large study of what to do with electric art furnace slag for the National Academy. And, and it's not a straightforward issue of, you know, because a, a, I mean, you think of it as 10% of the weight of steel. Yeah. It's a lot of slag. Yeah. And uh, people would like to do lots of things with it, but uh, you, you have to realize uh, certain things. I didn't realize uh, that just the fact that it's... Uh, pretty basic, uh, therefore you wouldn't want to ingest any of it, you know, for a beginning, you know, so you have to think about, is there dust that children could ingest? It's also a pretty hard uh, material that as you recycle it and you break it up, of course, to end up with the size distribution you would like, you have pretty sharp particles there that if ingested to a child is very problematic too. So there, there are some unintended consequences of what you do with the other streams coming out of an electric furnace. Yeah, that's very good. I was thinking about some of the community issues as well, Eric. Uh, a lot of the work that GTI Energy does is uh, looking at what impacts, uh, how to mitigate impacts, both <coughs> the expected and the unexpected. Um, and a big part of what we're doing is workforce development and workforce implications. And whenever you have a technology, um, we try to work closely with the technical team to understand what potential air emissions, water emissions, and discharges uh, can come out, and design work, um, workforce implications, like update to health and safety standards, update to risk assessment, so that um, there's not only monitoring, but a, some mechanism to help the workers who are working there um, take precautions to reduce their impacts. Um, uh, have information that goes, that's publicly accessible that the community can take to understand what the potential impacts of uh, technologies are. 
because even technologies that reduce some emissions can produce increases in, in other types of emissions. Uh, so having these types of metrics and transparency within the project team at least um, and putting in um, monitoring so we know what's going on as the project's being developed is, is crucially important. That's very good. I, okay, go ahead, David. I, I was going to shift gears a little bit since Eric brought it up, you brought it up, and given my own background, a, as we begin contemplating issues like a greener steel and, and perhaps uh, less carbonized grid and, and so forth, what does that then suggest, and, and you brought up issues as well, Eric, what does that suggest about how we should be evolving the curriculum at the university and thinking about requirements and so forth? Um, I know David and Alan have had to deal with this in the past, figure out how we jam more and more into the curriculum and you know, no one ever wants to take anything out, but uh, are there some, some bigger issues? Maybe we can start with you, David, and, and talk a little bit about how we should be thinking about this. Sure, I, I mean, I think you're right on the, nobody wants to ever take anything out. So um, if we want, you know, and I think, is, are there any students here that think they have lots of extra time and that we've given them plenty of time to ponder and think about things carefully and Take nah, not usual. So I, I think one of the challenges is we're asking people to make technical decisions. We expect our students to be able to walk out and think about the ramifications of the technical decisions at a level I think that is higher than we used to. Um, and I don't necessarily, I think back when I was a student, could I solve a problem was what I was being asked, not if I solve that problem, were there knock-on effects? And I don't think that, I think now most of the students come thinking about that. I don't think we as faculty necessarily address that yet. But I think of how do we integrate some concepts of sustainability across engineering disciplines is, good, is a challenge. Um, and I think it is a question of what do we want to take out because you know, extending it to saying that we're gonna go the civil engineering route and to be a professional engineer, you really need five years and a master's, I don't think is palatable to a lot of our, uh, you know, the educational system we have, so. Yeah, maybe Eric, you have some thoughts. Yeah, I'll add two things. Um, one of the, there's, there's a couple of routes that we, we um, put into community benefits plans and one is to move away from that model where you get educated, then you get a job and go into industry, you implement it, and then there's a product, and then if there's any community opposition to pollution, that's a downstream effect. And, and making it sort of a, a, first of all, a feedback internally where um, a, we, we've put together a couple projects where we try to make a consortium where there's more structured interaction between the industrial partner that's putting in a technology, a um, university, and then workforce training organizations and, and labor unions that do that kind of workforce training to try to get some form of information feedback, because I'm not the technical expert, but I know that there's some information that on application side that could feed back to the uh, curriculum side, and then we run up against that, that exact same problem, that we know there's a need to um, uh, do more research on this new technology, but then getting space into the educational side, so we're, setting up the structure for that interaction, how you guys do it on the academic side is, is something uh, that we need to figure out, but we're at least putting together that structured interaction. So that's, that's within the project, setting up these consortium between industry, uh, uh, academic, and, and training partners. And the other feedback mechanism we get is a two-way communication that's literally stated by the DOE requirements. Uh, to have two-way communication with, with communities. So we set up structured uh, information feedback where 
we can take new information from communities and feed it back to project teams, feed it back to uh, academic partners so that they have a, a little bit, they can broaden their uh, scope of what the impacts are, what, the, what the, uh, um, the concerns and priorities are on the ground, misinformation even, uh, and then, and then uh, adjust accordingly. Uh, and, and how many of you are um, required to get any tools for understanding community impact, social impact, uh, how to look at census data, how to look at energy burden, how to look at environmental burden? Very few, right? So um, another tool that we get is uh, training of technical young engineers and technical staff with environmental justice toolkits so that you could at least have the awareness and you have the tools to figure out what community impacts are. If air pollution is going to the community that's directly around the plant, how do you even assess in 15 minutes, how do you assess what, the, what, what existing burdens are within that community that you can be contributing to so you don't do what Alan mentioned of hey, there's already this heavily industrialized, heavily polluted area, let's just put the heavy pollution technologies in there, <laughs> right? And Because that's exactly how you get community opposition that stops projects. So earlier, one of the questions um, to Dr. Cram was, where do we stand with the current electric furnace, DRI base, and going to hydrogen as a refining source but that presupposes that the electricity you're using in the electric furnace and for the hydrogen creation is clean in and of itself. And that's huge because that's the big challenge. When, when you've got all these worldwide steelmakers saying that they want to be carbon neutral by 2050, that's not going to happen if we don't have clean electricity. So that goes back to putting it in the curriculum, it's not just in materials, it's in the whole of the engineering um, uh, department, you know, or at school. And um, it's good that we're working on things concurrently, but I, this is the biggest challenge I've seen, and I actually was making ingots when I started, and was on the project to justify the first um, ladle met station. So the technical challenges are really exciting, but the coordination is not something I have my hands around yet. Maybe, maybe I could <clears throat> talk about this in a different viewpoint, in the philosophy of what is an engineer, uh, and what do we need an engineer to be? I think we need engineers to be leaders, simply leaders. And the problem we have in society is we don't have enough engineers who are leaders. And this means engineers, although they are very narrow in certain areas, they need to be broad. They need to communicate well, they need to listen to other people, they need to look at the big problem and be able to bring people together to solve big problems. And they have to be willing to step up to go into politics. They have to be willing to step up and lead. And, and I think the big failure, and I'm going to be honest, it's my whole career, big failure of engineering is not realizing the role is to make leaders who are engineers. And I think if you f focus everything that way, these problems become straightforward. The fact is, yes, you should understand community. You should understand impact. You should understand the technology. But you should understand your role in life is to change things. You're a change agent as an engineer, not a person who works in a job. You're not a person who makes you know, things for the electronics industry. You're not a person whose whole life is just to make steel. You're a change agent with your education. And I think we haven't done a good job as engineers is explaining to everyone, use your abilities to change the world, one person at a time. That's really good. I, I was just going to. Too often we, we talk about engineers being problem solvers, and that's too narrow, too limiting. We need to be the leaders. David. And I was gonna say, I appreciate, I think we also need to have students be comfortable asking for help because you can't 
be perfect. You can't be great at everything. You can be good at some things, but you have to know when to ask for help in experts, and you have to know when to accept that help and to trust their expertise. And I think that's something we need to do a better job teaching people to ask earlier and to find trustworthy help quicker. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, I think that's phenomenal. That's right on, right on the money. Um, one of the things it, is not just asking for help. Um, it's getting the skill sets to learn to work in, in, in collaborations, in coalitions that are with people outside of your discipline because your ability to communicate with people with diff very different skill sets is what's needed to move to the next idea, to move that idea forward, because you, you, you recognize that you have a great skill set in here, and for you to get the awareness and start moving, you need to be in these multidisciplinary teams. You need to be in these teams that are, are across professions. Um, and, and learn how to work collaboratively with others. Uh, that, those are skill sets that I don't think are, are, are emphasized enough, but you know, we, we focus so much on the technical side, uh, but your ability to work with others in, in other professions to be able to get from point A to point B, that's just as valuable as your technical expertise. If I, if I could just, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And, and the thing that I, I discovered myself when I was provost and all of a sudden I had a law school, I had an architecture school, an engineering school, et cetera, et cetera, reporting to me was that uh, they speak in their own language. <laughs> and what you say is not what they hear. They hear their own language, but it's not what you meant. And when they talk to you, it's not what they meant to you. It's a very interesting thing. It took me a while to recognize that architects talking metaphors and what, what they're saying you, you have to interpret it's like a game but you know everyone's like that Le lawyers are very difficult to talk to because it's very transactional you know uh, so but I think that's something that everyone has to and it's part of when people say you have to work in multidisciplinary teams this is why you have to work in multidisciplinary teams to listen to learn how to listen and then start to understand what people mean by the way they say it and it's all in how we educated them we are educated in a certain way, so we think in a certain way, and we refer to things in a certain way. But architects are also educated, but they were educated in a different way, and they think in a different way because of that. And it's the history of the area. We're all living in the history of our areas. And if you don't have the background, it's very difficult to understand exactly what they mean, unless you spend time with them, and spend time socially with them. And the same with them all. And they become comfortable with you to say, I don't understand what you mean by that. And you say, what do you mean? You know, and, and then you start to realize the issue is communication in a very fundamental level. It's not the ability to speak English. It's the ability to understand everyone's English. And uh, the international thing adds another wrinkle to that too. You know, and because culture and language and what you mean is part of what you say also. So I, I found that that was the most interesting thing that I learned as provost was not only do I have to listen better, I just spend time to understand. And it was my issue, not theirs. That, that's the other big thing. It's your issue, not the, it's not they should learn to speak to me. It's you have to learn to speak to them so that they understand. Very good. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from the, uh, the audience. Who will wait? get the microphone so the question will be heard. Thank you, Professor. Uh, have uh, hydrocarbons or particularly biomaterials been tried in the reduction of iron ore processes? Yes, they have. Uh, and it's another way of getting charcoal, I mean, basically. Uh, I, I hear a lot of things about, you know, biomaterials and other things, and, and then when you look at it, it's a form of charcoal as a feed material into the furnace. Basically, how do you take any carbon source and turn it into a carbon source you can use? So, yes, there, there is many, uh, you know, areas, and there are companies doing some really interesting things because there's a lot of waste uh, biomaterials that are just thrown away that could actually be turned into fuel. 
Yeah, and not to get rid of the hydrogen to make charcoal first and then to have the iron come in, yeah. but have the hydrogen stay in and a yes. process that could uh, utilize the hydrogen for positive benefits. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure there are processes doing that also. It, ma it makes sense. Uh, again, it's how much can you make to make a difference? So unless you have sufficient volumes of hydrogen uh, and at uh, the reasonable price, yeah. uh, th then you... you, you have devil to using it. So we are in farm country, they would say we have a lot of biomass, not necessarily hydrogen. Ethanol, right? Yes. I, I, I was just going to say that um, the ArcelorMittal has got multiple projects going and they know they're <coughs> going to be using like sour hydrogen to start with because there's no way that they've got the clean green hydrogen available now. That raises issues for materials because anything that's containing this is going to corrode faster. Um, but ultimately, to get where we need to get, we need to get the clean hydrogen. Clean hydrogen. Right. Oh, and also we need an infrastructure to transport hydrogen. <laughs> The big problem with hydrogen, you know, as a graduate student and I started using hydrogen in one of my experiments, I learned very quickly that it truly is more flammable. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to watch it explode. Uh, and uh, I always remember in the lab watching the flame front run through my glasswork thinking, oh, that doesn't look good, you know. And there are significant issues with the distribution of hydrogen in an infrastructure that doesn't exist in the country. So. Uh, that, that's a, a, another issue with, uh, even if there was plenty of hydrogen volume, that becomes an issue of transportation and, you know, et cetera. Yeah, I was David. just going to comment on hydrogen embrittlement being the, <laughs> you know, like a good career path to get into right about now, because um, there will be problems coming up, because people will mispick things that oh, yeah. they didn't. What, that wasn't rated for this hydrogen service. Well, it, we didn't have an, that hydrogen it, service it, It's before. actually not an unintended. It is a consequence that we can pretty much anticipate, right? Yeah. So there was a question in the, the back. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to go back to how you said, like, there's, there has to be more leaders in the engineering field. Um, I think it's like a easy topic to say, but, like, it's a very simple explanation if you see me and my brother. I was good in math. I was incentivized to do that when I was a child. So I go to engineering school. My brother was good in English, so he just went into law school. And predominantly, if you see the actual uh, changes, I think me actually spending my time in the lab and doing my PhD work doesn't do that big of a change in the world and actually like my brother, maybe he can go back to politics, oh, go into politics and change it. So what do you think like a practical change in the curriculum or like the uh, incentive cycle for like children or like students uh, to change so that they could be incentivized to be more proactive, more um, into communication while actually being an engineering student at the same time? I think every engineering student should take introduction to law. Simple as that. Because without understanding the law, you can't do any of these things. And by the way, as an engineer, to understand the law, you can protect your intellectual property, etc. understanding this. So I, I, I was a big proponent always of there should be a lot more law in engineering curriculums, as important as anything else. Because the engineers are the ones that are developing the next uh, technologies, etc., that need to be protected. Uh, and need to protect themselves so that their own intellectual property isn't lost. But if you want to go on into anything, you have to have some knowledge. I don't say you have to be a lawyer. I don't mean that at all. But you have to have a knowledge of what the law process is and how it became as it is where you are. So I, I think for, for me, the first thing is understanding something uh, fundamental about how the law process works is necessary for everyone. And uh, the last one I'd say is we should all tell all engineers you can be anything you want to be. As a change agent, you are not stuck in a career path defined by the four years you spent in college. The four years you spent in college taught you to think in a certain way. It's going to be very valuable. But that way of thinking is very valuable in every area and actually more valuable than most backgrounds. And I'm not denigrating other backgrounds. It's just the, the mathematical bent and being numbers focused and actually being able to understand decision based on numbers 
it is very important now and is a way to make decisions that make better decisions faster than others. Intuition's not a good idea. I mean, it works occasionally, but it's not a good idea. It's like hope's not a strategy. So go ahead, Eric. Just very quick response. Uh, I, I recognize there, there are uh, structural and there are individual level decisions uh, that, that can be made. Uh, you, everything is set for you to go in one path and you can, as he said, Al said, you can go work for a company, get a job, and then just do that job. Like, nothing's pushing you to do anything extra. Nothing's pushing you to be a leader. Nothing's pushing you to, to um, assess community impacts and, and whatnot. Uh, but you, as an individual, with the encouragement to take on those and expand your role, uh, broaden out, uh, work with others across disciplines, helps push that a little bit in the right direction. And from the top down, Structurally, they see the need to change some of the, there's, there's, I think there's pressure on, on education to incorporate more uh, community impacts, diversity impacts into curriculum because they see that a lot of these projects, they get halted because it, even a good technological project, if they don't work well with communities, they'll get community opposition, environmental group opposition, and it'll stop. <laughs> Right, so uh, I think that's the motivation for putting community benefits into funding, federal funding requirements. Uh, so there's that top down, but you as an individual, you can make the decision to be a leader. You can make the decision to incorporate some more awareness of community impacts and, and move in that direction on your own. There, another question right here, and then we'll come to you. Oh. Well, we've got two microphones, so we're going to go with you first, and then you're next. You had yours first? All right. All right. You guys worked it out. Go ahead. So, uh, you guys hear me? Okay. So, something here answered my question, the first question about um, the hydrogen um, issues for uh, engineering. But my question, second question is, how, do, how can materials engineering like solve problems in astro engineering and also like space exploration issues. Like what's some ways like materials engineering can fix some problems in, the, in that field? Why did everyone look at me right away? <laughs> um, no, I would let you go first. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I, I no, it, it's, so we had a speaker in one of our seminars a couple weeks ago who said he thought materials was a great background because it meant that everybody used materials, so you had to learn that everybody had materials problems and that your, your job was not necessarily to bring your material solution to their problem, but to figure out what their problem was and was it tied to the materials they were using. And there's usually something <coughs> So if you look outside of, you know, we've been talking about making bulk materials, making structural materials very early down the feedstock. But if you think about then how do you apply that to, you know, the, the thing above you, right? Since we're in Armstrong Hall and there's always a certain throwback to the fact that there's like a space aspect to things. Um, material challenges, how do you make it more efficiently, how to use less energy, how to use something that's more recyclable, that does, that, that pervades not just how you make it the first time, but then how you use it and where it goes. So I, I think there's a lot of potential for any industry uh, that has materials problems. I think one of the things you asked was about space exploration. Yes. One of the biggest issues is where's the oxygen coming from? because you can't take it all with you. You have to make it there. And that's a materials processing issue. And uh, obviously that's an electricity issue and there are many ways of doing that. But you know that, that you start going through that and you see that uh, many of the technologies we've already developed, you just change uh, into the situation you're going into and you can come up with novel technologies because uh, all of a sudden the financial constraint has been taken away because you just have to have oxygen. It doesn't matter how much it costs. 
if you're going to do it, for example, and, and many things like this. So I, I think there's a great future for materials in space exploration, in the materials for space, and et cetera, and it's application of what we know to this new frontier, understanding what are the properties that are necessary to survive. This is another one I was thinking of example, like um, the splashdown example, like, um, like, like the spacecraft going through the atmosphere. I think um, making metals that, that can withstand the heat from the atmosphere could, could be a great like, um, problem to solve for using the materials engineering as well, I think. So. Very good. Actually, years and years ago when I was at Michigan Tech, I ran into an alum that worked on the ablation process by which uh, they dissipate the heat. There was a question. All right. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Okay, um, so follow up on the discussion before about all sorts of different things, um, I guess interdisciplinary work as engineers, um, thinking with numbers, uh, and hopefully I'll find my question as I keep talking, but I, I'm thinking about this, uh, I've seen the change within myself as I did my undergrad in engineering and now uh, starting grad school where I'm thinking more in numbers and I'm, I'm approaching problems from that side. But I didn't, I wasn't always like that. And the more I look around, I almost feel like most people aren't like that. And when you talk in numbers, even though that represents maybe the objective truth, that's not what people respond to. And so what is your advice for these kind of situations as a young engineer? Um, I think we saw it with COVID, we see it with a lot of such things where People just don't, as you said, speak the same language. How do you overcome that barrier? I think the first thing we have to realize is not all people need our brilliance. You know? <laughs> I, I, need our brilliance. <laughs> oh. you know, but they need our knowledge. They need our wisdom. So we have to learn to communicate it in a way that everyone can understand. Uh, and, and doing that sometimes means we have to change the way we talk to people. Uh, unless... Uh, you know, being, we're all have a problem of being impressed by our own impressiveness, you know, you know, if you want to look at it that way, we're smart, you know, and we like people to know that, and it's a failing and a benefit, you know, but I think the answer is that learning how to talk to people so they understand your point without having to take them through the derivation of the equation to get there is really important. I mean, among engineers, you, you can't do that. They actually want to know, how did you get to that answer? And explain it to them in detail so that they will accept it. They will go through their own derivation and say, yeah, that, that's correct. But uh, for many people, they're willing to accept that you have the intelligence and the ability to do this, and they don't, but they want to know the answer. You know, and they want you to tell them the answer in a way that they have confidence in you. So... Um, I, I am an engineer, so I do want the data, not necessarily every piece of data. And I always used to joke at work, why did the engineer write a 10-page report? Because he had, didn't have the time to write a one-page report. And it's really important, and it's a big skill, to be able to only give the elevator pitch, or if you were presenting to somebody in the DOD, one of my fellow um, materials grads um, went to war college and she was wor working at the Pentagon. I mean, she had five minutes to tell a general what they should be doing. And they also wanted to know she had the data. They may not want to see every piece of it, but the data is important, so I'm glad you like it. Um, but. I agree totally. You need to know your audience and what you're trying to accomplish when you put your summaries together. First, Eric, and then yep. David. When you go to law school, they, they, what they teach is a way of thinking, not the knowledge that they give. When you go to engineering, it's a way of thinking. When you go to sociology, it's a way of thinking. Like, you're, you're specializing in a way of thinking. And as they both mentioned, if you're not able to communicate that to others who are not in your group, that's where the boundary comes. All the siloed things where you, you're, we're encouraged to use complex 
language that only those in the in-group understand, that hinders actual progress. Because if you can't get from the 10-pager to the one-pager and explain clearly exactly what you're trying to convey, that's why we have the whole science communication effort, and there's specialists in science communication, because they can convey complex thoughts very clearly so that others can use it, build on it, and interact. Hey, you didn't think about this. You didn't think about this. How does that apply to this? You can't answer that question if you're only speaking within your own framework. So that's why communication is crucial. So I, I was going to suggest two things. The first is, have you seen Three Minute Thesis? So I think there's a lot of examples online. I don't know if the ones at Purdue are always the most impressive. I will be blunt. Um, I think I've seen better ones from elsewhere. Um, three Minute Thesis is a really neat competition because you only have three minutes and you have to explain it clearly, succinctly to a broad audience. Um, the other thing I was going to say is I asked my first year engineering class, which I think I can't see because the light, but I think they're all gone, so then I can talk about them. Um, I asked them to do me in a minute slides for material, introduce themselves as if they were a material, and they all managed to keep it to a minute. If I think if I asked the seniors to do that, not a single one of them would be able to keep it to a minute. And so I don't know if it's that they're more scared of me and follow instructions or that something we do between when they showed up on campus and they become seniors um, teaches them, makes them, makes it harder for them to only say what they want in a minute. So I don't know if we do it to them or if it's part of what we have. Yes, please. So a little different question. So we are talking about structural materials. So there is the one structural material and considering in, on a global picture, bamboo. So like there's a community aspect of it as well. So what, what are your views on this as a, like can we uh, put our resources into engineering that material and, and making some more solutions instead of steel with that material? Oh, we certainly see bamboo through the Asian world being used as a structural material. It's, in that it's been you know, one of the ancient materials, right? Also one of the fastest growing plants we have, so, uh, and uh, doesn't degrade very quickly once it's cut down, so it's, it's an excellent uh, material to begin with. So it's a matter of acceptance of the customer, you know, and what you can make with bamboo is quite different than what you're going to make with other materials. And as long as you can... Uh, make uh, the final end product that's acceptable to the customer, it would be fine. But it, bamboo is a fine material in, in the right circumstance for use. I think um, that is a good example of one of the pushbacks from communities where how, how often have you heard that you need to look at the entire life cycle from source to sink to decommissioning? Like, where, where are the waste streams going? What communities are impacted by the waste streams? If you're, not thinking, if you're only thinking of the process within the factory, you're not thinking about the entire sustainability of, of renewable resources, uh, the, the forever chemicals and everything that's in, in the end products. And those are the uh, cumulative environmental burdens that, that uh, communities deal with which pushes the engineers to think in terms of entire life cycles. So I, I think that bamboo is a good example of that. Very good. I see you. I'll stand up. <laughs> I am currently building a campaign here at Purdue to get the steel mill um, you know, companies in northern Indiana to commit to being low carbon in order to protect the environment, protect the affected communities, and keep manufacturing jobs here in Indiana. What do you think it would take in order to convince them to commit to low carbon production and change the way that they've done things in the past? So um, ArcelorMittal sold the ArcelorMittal USA component to Cleveland Cliffs. So you're dealing primarily with Cleveland Cliffs at this point. I actually went on their website and there's a stark difference between the Cleveland Cliffs and the ArcelorMittal website on this issue. And I would say the biggest reason for that 
is because ArcelorMittal is in partnership with Spain for the Spain plant and Germany for the Germany plant. And a lot of the money that's going into um, this is from ArcelorMittal, don't get me wrong, but a lot of it is from Canada and Spain. And so when you're dealing with the people in Northwest Indiana in the United States, I know SDI has got the same commitment um, that ArcelorMittal does, but um, I still see uh, a focus on return on investment because it's a cyclical industry and they want to be around next year, let alone in 2050. So, um, I mean, we can talk later if you want, but it's a, ch it's a challenge that I totally understand and it goes back to what Dr. Cram said throughout his whole presentation. Um, sustainable means that you've got to be able to stay in business too, so. Um, but it's a laudable goal, so. I don't think you're going to have any problem with any of the steel plants saying they're not in, f in favor of that. The issue will be the definition of what do you mean by minimal carbon, carbon right? I think they'll all say that they all have programs to do that, uh, and they all want to do that. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me that they'd be willing to support whatever you're going on in, uh, openly. Uh, because, I mean, let's face it, that uh, one thing we should realize all the people who are uh, owning steel companies or working for steel companies have families and children, and they're concerned about the future also. It's just a difficult problem to solve. But I, I think if you go to the individual steel companies, they'll all say, we believe in that too. That's really good. It did, was, go ahead, Eric. They do believe in it. Yeah. They do believe in it. The question is, are they going to spend money on it? They'll spend whatever money they have. <laughs> One of the they, kickers. They do believe in it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the kickers to get uh, uh, spend, uh, companies to spend money on it um, are the federal requirements uh, mm -hmm. for community benefits that are tied to federal funds for um, sustainability technologies or clean energy technologies. Putting those in commitments and they put it into the plan and that gets executed into a contract that they then have to follow. And that's why they, um, uh, that's, that moves from wanting to do it to then now you have to do it by contract. <laughs> here's the metrics, here's the monitoring that you committed to. And then, you know, the entire issue is uh, getting to that contract in the first place. Before coming to GTI, I worked as zoning administrator for the city of Gary. It's the same thing. Uh, you have companies who want to do the good thing, but when you get down to putting the plans and what are they can execute, they say, what does the zoning code make us do? <laughs> right? And it goes back to Alan's point of, hey, do you know the law or do you not know the law? Thank you. That's very good. I, uh, David, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, in a few minutes, we have to invite people down to the reception. So I will let you wrap up. Okay. All right. We have, can we have one last very short, very short question? Hello? Uh, I'll try my best here. Um, I know that being an engineer, you want to lead and you want to progress the world to the future. However, just with history, you need to have public buy-in to get anywhere. So whether it's world wars, a nuclear race, a space race, that's when we really had scientific advancement. Today, when you see the public and policy and legislation being passed that doesn't go along with science as much as it used to, how can we work on that? How can we as engineers present that to become the leaders? I, I think that's why we don't have enough engineers in Congress or the Senate. You know, I, I've met with many of them, but I, I know that there are very few PhDs who are in the Senate or the Congress, for example. Very few have an engineering background. And, and if you have people making decisions without some people there who can explain the impact of these decisions on an engineering base, well, why is science important? You know, why is engineering important? And, and it's all very well to have the NSF and you know, the, all the other national things. The fact is, without someone there uh, actually in the committees who's willing to speak for science, speak for <coughs> engineering in a reasonable way, uh, with the background that they have gravitas to speak on that, we, we have a problem. Uh, and uh, fundamentally, that's one of the largest problems we have. If we were in China, 
we'd find that most of the leaders had a science and engineering background. Quite different than here. Now, they have other backgrounds too, but, you know, but that, if you look at the, the leadership and which disciplines they come from, they were proponents of engineering and science. And that leads to a different discussion about the importance of, of science and funding of science. And I'm really talking about the funding of science here, which is your question. And if you look at who's funding science, it's uh, countries that have engineers and scientists at the top levels that understand the benefits to their country of doing this. But you're absolutely correct. I mean, in, in real dollars, we're well behind what we used to be. And if you look at uh, leadership of technology, when I came here to go to graduate school from Europe, there was only one place in the world to go if you wanted to do top class research. It was the country that funded research at universities more than any other country in the world. That was the United States, best research country in the world. Without a doubt, not even a set, there was no second choice. That's not true now. There are many countries you can go to that have outstanding research abilities where you can go and do a great PhD with great faculty. Uh, most of them trained here, by the way, and then <laughs> gone somewhere else. Huh? So we're still the training ground of the professors of the world. But uh, this fact that we don't invest in our own scientific and engineering uh, infrastructure, and more than that, we don't invest in our people to become the leaders in this. I mean, the, the fact is that regardless of the research that's done, the most important output of research is the graduate student that graduates and goes on to actually change everything. So uh, that, that's something we've lost uh, and, and beca become not as uh, competitive as we, I mean, we used to be the dominant force here in my lifetime. When I went to graduate school to do a PhD, there was nowhere else I wanted to go. And the facilities that were in American universities were unbelievable compared to the facility I had in one of the best universities in Scotland. I mean, it was like uh, coming from a high school to university, you know. So uh, it's a very important point you're bringing up, and we need to bring everyone back to the viewpoint that we need to invest in research. We need to invest in graduate programs across the country, in all areas, uh, not just engineering, in all areas. I think that's a good spot to end up on. Let's, let's thank all the panelists once again.